evening, everyone, and welcome to this our UNSW Aviation webinar. We're really delighted that you're joining us uh, wherever it is that you're tuning in from around the world. It's great to have you joining us here today. We've got a, a whole host um, of staff and students here from UNSW Aviation who are going to cover all of our degree offerings in really good detail um, and make sure that today really is, is that opportunity for you to get all of your questions answered. So whether it's about what it's going to be like as a, as a current student, when it looks at you know, I guess the student experience side of things, everything you can look forward to uh, when you start studying with us, uh, but also what the career uh, aspects of, of working the, the aviation industry are like. It's a very dynamic and very interesting industry, which has obviously undergone a lot of change recently, um, but really is, is at the cutting edge um, of, of everything from the commercial side of things um, to, you know, personal travel as well. And so we'll cover um, everything that that entails um, and more. Um, and as I say, this is really a great opportunity to be able to connect in with, with UNSW, with some of our experts here and some of our current students, um, but also is a, a really great opportunity um, to ensure that you're getting all of your questions answered. So on that note, um, we'll kick things off. I'd like to begin by firstly um, acknowledging the Bedigal people, the Gadigal, the Ngunnawal, the Daruk, uh, and the Eora peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the land that the UNSW campuses stand on, including the Bankstown Airport campus. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So, as I mentioned, we've got a, a whole host of our, our staff who are going to be joining us uh, today, as well as some of our, our students. Um, and we're, yeah, we're going to be de delighted to, to have, firstly, uh, Associate Professor Brett Molesworth, who's our Head of School of Aviation, um, who'll be joining us shortly to give an introduction to UNSW. Uh, aviation and what it's like to apply for our aviation management programs, what they entail, and also what the career opportunities look like for students who are interested in going down that route. We're also going to have Malcolm Good, our Director of Flight Operations and Chief Pilot here at UNSW Aviation, um, who's going to walk us through in, in detail what the Batch of Aviation Flying Program degree looks like, um, how we integrate that flight training. Um, he's going to dive into what it's like at our Bankstown Airport Flight Operations Unit um, and the whole host of aircraft and simulators that we have um, that we use to train uh, the next generation of pilots. We're also going to have June and Zoe, two of our uh, aviation students here to join us as well and talk about their experiences, um, what you can look forward to both inside the classroom, but also outside the classroom when it comes to things like the Club and Societies program. We'll talk a bit about Aviation Society um, and all the, the host of events and networking opportunities um, that they have as well. At the very end of the session, we're going to have a Q&A. Um, so I encourage you, and I know some of you have already started putting questions into the chat, which is brilliant. So make sure you throw all of your, your questions um, into that Q&A. We've got our team in the wings who are going to be um, rifling through those questions, collating them, um, and then we're going to cover as many as we possibly can at the very end of the session. So on that note, I'm going to give us a really quick introduction to UNSW, and, and many of you may already be familiar with UNSW, um, but for those of you who aren't, we are uh, obviously located here in Sydney, um, and we're uh, you know, really fortunate to be a top 50 uh, world ranking university. So it means that you're going to be joining a, a community of 60,000 plus students who are studying themselves over 300 degrees. And really, I mean, in terms of UNSW and our heritage, um, there's a huge amount of breadth that you get to tap into and a huge amount of, of world leading expertise as well. So as a university, we actually date back to 1949. And look, we were brought in because there was a, a skill shortage of scientists and engineers um, at that time following World War II here in Sydney um, and, and Australia more broadly. And so as a university, we were brought in to fill that gap. Now, since then, we've broadened ourselves to cover six unique faculties, everything from our business school to um, you know, our, our science faculty, medicine and health, arts, design and architecture, um, you know, and a whole host um, of, of you know, faculties, but also degrees and double degree options um, that come along with that. Um, but in addition to that, it means that you're you're going to have a, a whole host of students that you're going to meet. Even if you're doing the, the aviation programs with us, you're going to be mingling with students who are doing degrees and programs from many different faculties in many different areas. And that's going to broaden your mindset, broaden the opportunities that are available to you in terms of um, you know, challenging your mindset, challenging your ideas and really building your networks and friendships, uh, which will ultimately stay with you for life. Behind all of our faculties, we have our central work integrated learning platform. And, and look, work integrated learning is kind of one of those phrases that might not mean too much to you at this point in time, but ultimately is 
Um, something that's that's really important at university because it's our way of connecting you in 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 many op you know many uh, avenues to be able to connect you in with industry. So work integrated learning effectively means that you are um, as a student you're doing units of credit um, which count back uh, towards your degree, but they are internship opportunities. Um, you might be working say with a marketing agency for you know three days a week um, in the city and that counts back towards your degree. We try to embed these across all of our degrees to ensure there are those practical components and indeed with our aviation programs we're going to talk about how practical they are today because they are you know degrees which by their very nature uh, mean that there's there's a lot of practicality already embedded in there, a lot of industry connections as well. Now, as a, a university, I already mentioned, we're very fortunate to be in the top 50 globally. But what that means for you is that you're going to be learning from academics who are really at the forefront of their particular field. And often they'll bring that knowledge into the classroom um, even before it's been published. So you're getting access um, to that cutting edge uh, you know, insights, research and developments, uh, which really mean that, that it gives you a competitive edge as a graduate because you, you have that forward thinking mentality um, and you've been able to tap into that and prepare yourself for what your career is going to look like. As a university, we, we have 300 exchange partners in more than 35 countries. And while unfortunately because of the, the pandemic over the past few years, we've had to rein in that exchange program, we're really optimistic that we'll be getting that back online very shortly. And hopefully by the time many of you come to join us here at UNSW, um, there'll be lots of those exchange opportunities you'll be able to tap into as part of your degree. We're also very fortunate to have Australia's most employable graduates, um, and that, that is for three years running. And I think it's testament to the fact that our students really like to push the boundaries. So we have a, a whole host of support opportunities, everything from um, our Michael Crouch Innovation Centre, which is where a lot of our startup founders and entrepreneurship endeavours come from, um, but all the way through to things like our Career and Employability Office who help you with things like interview skills and interview preparation, how to write a really good cover letter and resume, how to reach out to employers and go along to networking events. And they really bridge the, the gap between university and industry um, to ensure that you are um, as employable as possible when you graduate. Now, our School of Aviation is located within the Faculty of Science um, here at UNSW. Um, and as I kind of alluded to before, we've actually got over 400 partner organisations. We're going to touch on some of those today um, that you get to connect in with as part of, of being the community here at UNSW Science. Um, we also have seven of our subjects ranked in the top 50 globally, so we are really trying to strive for innovation there and bringing that into the classroom as much as possible. Um, but we also are really about having that global impact and um, you know, our, our graduates from science, but also you know, from, from aviation go on to have global careers. They go on to every corner of the globe um, and they're really inspired to make change and, and make a real impact. Now, if you're joining us internationally, which most of you uh, will be, you're, you're probably thinking, well, what is it like in Sydney? Well, I mean, for a bit of context, if you haven't been to Sydney before, it's a phenomenal city where we're down by the coast. Um, there's a bit of a snapshot there of the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. Um, you can almost see in the very back top left corner of that image uh, the UNSW campus. We're located about uh, 15 minutes by light rail from the centre of the CBD, so the centre of the, the middle of our, of, uh, of our city here in Sydney, um, which means that we're, we're fortunate to be very close to the city, but we also have um, you know, our, our own campus vibe and our own, we're almost like a mini city. There's there's a you know a hundred buildings on campus. Um, and in terms of, of you know the the vibe and the atmosphere around the campus, um, we have, we've got lots of great cafes and restaurants um, and there's uh, you know re really a whole host of, of great nightlife and, and restaurants that are re really within a stone's throw of the campus and indeed the CBD um, is, is definitely a part of that. So you know Sydney it's, it's Australia's financial hub. We've been voted the best city um, many many times before which we're, we're obviously delighted about but we are a very diverse city and, and you know 32 percent almost of our population are born overseas we speak over 250 languages in Sydney um, so it means that you know we're a very multicultural um, and multilinguistic uh, city and that really is reflected in in terms of our our um, you know our, our culture here at UNSW as well you're going to be meeting people from all around the world in the classroom and it's going to broaden your mindset, um, but also open up uh, lots of other opportunities when it comes to building those networks, but also building those connections that will be lifelong connections and will really help get you ahead uh, when it comes to graduating and going out there on your career. 
Now, on that note, you've probably heard enough from me, so I'll be back a little bit later um, when we get to our Q&A component, but I'm going to throw over now to our head of school uh, here at UNSW Aviation. We're really delighted to have Associate Professor Brett Molesworth joining us to give us a bit of an insight into UNSW Aviation and also to cover off our aviation management programs. So welcome to the virtual stage, Brett. Thanks for coming along. Thank you, Nick, and thanks for the warm introduction. And, and let me extend that to everyone else tonight. So thank you. I want to talk about the school and I briefly just talk about the school and overview of the school as well as um, the programs that we have. So if we could move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, as you as Nick mentioned, the aviation industry and, and by extension, the tourism industry um, experienced a bit of a downturn over the last couple of years, but it wasn't all negative. There was a number of positives with this downturn in terms of the aviation industry. For example, you'll note on the screen there, freight. Um, during the COVID-19, there was a huge demand in freight. If we have a look at other services that, uh, that are provided by the aviation industry, such as medical services, um, they were in high demand too. In Australia, we have, as you may know, we're a vast country and we have a number of um, mines and we've got fly-in, um, fly-out workers. And so they prospered during that time. So while the aviation industry, from a commercial perspective, in terms of passenger movement, declined, there were other parts of the industry that remained strong. But what we're seeing now is phenomenal growth in the industry, so much so that growth has surpassed the 2019 levels. And if we have a look at the US um, today, um, the reports coming out of the US indicate with United Airlines alone, there's 6,000 pilots short. We know internationally, and especially in Europe, um, air travel from a commercial perspective is increased 10% from the 2019 levels. So there is phenomenal growth. And I've only mentioned about pilots. There are many other professionals in the aviation industry other than pilots. We've got cabin crew. We've got the professionals that manage the pilots, that manage the airlines and manage um, airports. And so we're experiencing phenomenal growth in that industry. So it looks exceptionally positive. Let me park aviation or trad what's traditionally known as aviation. That's the man side. We've, all, we've also got growth in the unmanned aerial vehicles. So these are drones, remotely piloted aircraft. We have um, high demand for pilots in that area too. So it is looking very positive for the aviation industry. Um, and you'll see a number of the, a number of the forecasts there uh, 2026, 2040, 2050, the um, request for pilots and professional staff is beyond what any normal school could deliver. So it is very positive from that point of view. Um, if we move on and, and talk about our graduates and what the industry is looking for, and they're looking for indiv individuals who are professionals, who are well-rounded. They don't only have to have the qualifications that's desired for a pilot, for example, which may be a commercial pilot's license, but they're looking for an individual with knowledge and ability to critically think. And we get that from studying at a university, for example. So if we could move to the next slide, please. And if we think about careers in aviation, and these are the two traditional careers in aviation, the first one's flying, and this is when we're thinking about pilots. So we've got pilots that operate um, aircraft that fly internationally and domestically. At a local level, you've got regional airlines too. If we move away from the commercial side and we look at then business, and you've got um, both fixed wing aircraft pilots as well as, well as helicopter pilots. Within the fixed wing aircraft, you've got charter organisations. You've got, like I mentioned before, the medical area, such as the Royal Flying Doctor Service in Australia. You've got agricultural flying. You've got pilots that conduct research and they do surveys or other um, data collection methods in aircraft. And then we've got the military. So we have a breadth of different jobs within the flying sector, apart from what's traditionally known or referred to as commercial aviation. And like I mentioned before, the other branch of flying is the management. And these are the individuals that oversee, that plan, um, that direct pilots in, in their roles. And there are many different roles within the management side, far greater than flying per se. And we've listed a few there. Um, one that's uh, my background is human factors and aviation safety. 
So we have safety professionals that that um, oversee uh, the risk and the hazards within aviation and attempt to control those. We've got what you would commonly know or would be, um, be familiar with is air traffic controllers that direct pilots around. But like I mentioned before, you've got professionals that manage airports, that manage airlines. And these are all students or components of the degree that we that we teach here at UNSW. So a quick, and it'll be very quick because Malcolm, our, our Chief Flight Flying um, Director will provide greater details in this area. But as a pilot, you'll need some basic qualifications and those being a commercial pilot's license, as well as an instrument rating. We at UNSW provide individuals with what's called an ATPL, and that's a frozen ATPL where you learn the theory associated with um, airline, air, airline flights. What you do need to be a commercial pilot with fair paying passengers is generally between two, uh, sorry, generally between 500 and 2000 flight hours. If we look at from an aviation management perspective, so our degree, um, there are many degrees that you can complete that can lead to pathways in aviation. But ours is highly regarded because we offer specialised knowledge in the area of aviation. So there are generalist degrees that you can um, undertake, such as in engineering or business, but we offer a specific degree that provides broad knowledge in the area of aviation, and that's aviation management and operational. And hence, um, the, the degree that we provide um, is well respected within the industry. Um, as Nick mentioned, we have quite a high employability rate following um, programs at UNSW, and that's inclusive of UNSW Aviation. What we're proud of with our degree, it builds not only knowledge, but ability to critically think. And that ability helps you or helps the student um, uh, manage situations. And in actual fact, they go on to be leaders within that area. So if I can move to the next slide too, please. So a brief history about the school, and I'll only keep this, uh, it'll be very short. We, we were established in 1995 and we have two locations. The top two images provide, um, depict our location out at Bankstown Airport, where in the far left hand corner you see our offices and in the right hand corner you see our hangar with one aircraft being moved. Beneath that you'll see two images and they're of our campus at, at Kensington. The school comprises approximately 80 staff, and that's academic, professional staff, including flight instructors. Um, every year, we have approximately 150 undergraduate and 150 postgraduate students. So we have a total of about 300 students. Every year, we complete approximately 6,500 flight hours. Some years, that's um, uh, there are a little more, and then some are a little less. If we could go to the next slide, please. A quick overview of our aircraft and our simulators. On the far left, you'll see we've got 10 Diamond DA-40s and these are single engine four-seater aircrafts. The one beneath that, we've got the PA-44, which is a seminal aircraft. Again, it's a four-seater aircraft, that, though it's, this time it's a, a twin engine aircraft. We have a number of simulators. These are both located at Bankstown Airport, um, out where our flight operations unit is, as well as at um, UNSW Kensington, um, where we use a flight simulator for research. So I'll let Malcolm talk about those a little bit later. So if we could move to the next slide, please. As Nick mentioned, we are the um, one of the highest ranked universities in, a, in the world, um, ranked 44th, um, one of the most recent rankings. We're the only university in the top 50 that offer an, a degree in aviation. And we're proud of the um, attributes our students bring to the industry per se. We own and operate our aircraft, so we own a number of DA-40 aircraft as well as the Seminoles, and then I mentioned before we have a number of simulators. One of those is a 737 simulator as well as the DA-40 simulator and our um, precision flight simulator at, at Kensington that we use for, for research per se. Importantly, we um, hold our own Air Operator Certificate, which provides us the ability to deliver flight training. If we look at pathways into the aviation industry, and we'll just move to the next slide, please. Thank you, and, and to the next slide again. We have a number of undergraduate and postgraduate programs, and I'll briefly touch on a few of these, not all. 
The first one I've mentioned thus far is the Bachelor of Aviation Management, and this is a three year degree. The second one is the Bachelor of Aviation Flying, which is also a three year degree. However, it combines both flying qualifications, like I mentioned before about the ATPL, as well as um, university qualifications, such as broad knowledge in the area of aviation management, airline management, airline operations, human factors and safety, law to name a few. The third there under the undergraduate heading is a double degree. So this is a four year degree where we combine both Bachelor of Aviation Management with a Bachelor of Commerce. And then we've listed a number of postgraduate programs and I'll just touch on those or they're listed there, but we will go through them in a moment. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So just to recap that management programs, a three year degree and it's covers all the key aspects necessary to ensure you are fully prepared for the aviation industry from a managerial perspective. And we expect leaders completing the Bachelor of Aviation Management, uh, or sorry, we expect students completing the Bachelor of Aviation Management to be leaders in the area. And they move on into professional roles um, within the within aviation per se. And, um, Oh, and some of the core courses there, um, as you can see on the screen at the moment, we've got maths, physics and stats. And then we move into areas such as human factors and safety, importantly, airline operations and management, as well as airport operations and management. We move into simulation, um, economics and air traffic management. Um, the Bachelor of Aviation Management has a specialisation in management per se. Um, and we're looking, sorry, we continually look at refining our program and that's something on, um, on the cards that we are refining and introducing new areas of specialty. But at the moment we have a broad specialisation in management. And as I mentioned, it covers various topics and those topics are listed on that second or the lower point there. If we can move on to the next, thank you. Entry requirement, um, this is for international students. So we've neglected or, or or skipped over the, the entry requirements for Australian because this target audience is internationally. Um, we have the ATAR equivalent of 75. Um, I'll let you read the rest there because they'll be applicable to your local area. And if we move to the next slide, we talk about postgraduate programs. And I mentioned we have at least five different postgraduate program offers. Um, they range from a, a graduate diploma, which is a one year um, degree, to a PhD, which is a four year maximum degree. And then we've got degrees in the middle, such as a master's degree, which we offer both by coursework and both by research. So if I could move on to the next slide, please. So when you're applying for our program, and it depends on um, where you're located in the world. For those in Australia, you would apply through the University Admission Centre um, or online, depending upon where you're located. If we could move to the next slide, thank you. Importantly, um, in, there are English language requirements and those English language requirements apply for both pilots flying and um, you may or may not know, but there is an English language proficiency test that a pilot must pass to ensure that he or she um, uh, um, level of English is sufficient to effectively communicate over the radio. And similarly, there are English language requirements uh, to obtain entry into UNSW. And there is a minimum with terms of IELTS and that's 6.5 as stated there. So I'll let you read the rest in relation to those English requirements. Um, I'll pass over to um, Malcolm Good. He's the Director of Flight Operations um, and our Chief Pilot out at UNSW Banks down the Flight Operations Unit. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Brett, for, for covering that, that deep dive into aviation management and a bit of a, a history of, of UNSW Aviation and what we get up to here. Um, you've stolen my thunder by introducing Malcolm, um, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll bring bring to the screen Malcolm, who uh, we're, we're again delighted to have with us. He's our Director of Flight Operations and our Chief Pilot here at UNSW Aviation, um, and he's going to really dive in, as uh, Brett was saying before, into our batch of aviation flying and what that entails out of our flight operations unit in Bankstown. So um, Malcolm, over to you. 
Thanks, Nick. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thanks for giving us your time tonight to tell uh, tell you about our, our programs and our university. Um, I've been working at UNSW for 20 years and been the director of flying operations for the last three. Uh, and what I'll be doing is, is giving you an overview and some details about the Bachelor of Aviation Flying. Um, I'll I'll give you as much as I think uh, is necessary, but of course, I don't want to put you to sleep uh, and I don't want to waste your time. So if if there are any questions, if I don't cover anything, please put them in the chat and we'll address them uh, soon. And of course, you'll um, be able to um, hear from the student shortly as well. So what you can see on the screen is an overview of the flying parts of the Bachelor of Aviation Flying. There are some other academic components um, that I'll cover shortly, but 200 hours of flying is the um, is included in the course. 130 of those are with an instructor and 70 of those are by yourself in the aeroplane. About 160 uh, of those 200 hours are in the single engine DA-40 aeroplanes you uh, can see behind me uh, and the other 40 are in the in the Piper Seminole that was on the screen before. So. First year, second year, third year, you can see uh, each is split up into two rows. In uh, first year, academic courses at Kensington, terms one and terms two. And then um, in term three, the, the flying specific aeronautical knowledge starts with, with what's called an RPL. That's the first license you'll get, a recreational pilot license. Uh, and along with that, four hours of flying in the DA-40 for flight selection. And I'll talk about flight selection a bit more in a moment. In second year, your commercial uh, theory courses begin. So term one, we have uh, three courses there, or it's, it's four commercial subjects over three academic courses. Uh, in term two, uh, the other three um, CPL courses, and, and, and each one of them has a, uh, a CASA exam. CASA is the, the regulator in Australia. So to get a pilot license, you have to pass theory exams and practical exams in the aeroplanes called flight tests uh, and each one of these commercial courses in second year has its its own uh, exam conducted by the regulator. Uh, in term three, instrument rating and instrument rating is the qualification that allows you to fly an aeroplane in bad weather. Um, at the same time in second year, you'll start with a recreational pilot license, which is about 40 hours in the DA-40. Uh, a private pilot course of training is about 31 hours and that's where you begin flying cross country. So navigation flying uh, to other airports away from uh, the Bankstown area and then 87 hours in the DA-40 for your commercial pilot license and that ends with with a flight test with me or, or, or someone else from the um, flying operations unit and that's the license you need well, the first license anyway, you need to, to work as a pilot and get paid, which should be your goal. Um, after that, multi-engine class rating, you learn to fly the Seminole, that takes about nine hours, and then your instrument rating. Um, along with the instrument rating, 29 hours in the air, there's about 20 hours uh, before that in the simulator. Uh, term one, third year, academic courses at Kensington again, and then for terms two and three, your air transport uh, theory knowledge that Professor Molesworth um, spoke about earlier. And this is the aeronautical knowledge you need to get an air transport pilot license. Uh, that's the highest uh, grade of license there is, and that's the license that's required to be the captain of an airliner. Uh, along with that, an elective. Now, uh, the elective uh, I'll, I'll describe later. We've obviously had some trouble in the pandemic with many of our international students returning home and um, not being able to get back because the borders closed, but all those problems are solved now. Uh, so that by the time you uh, will be here in third year, which I guess would be 2025, um, then these electives um, you know, it will be offered to you. So flight selection is is a part of the Bachelor of Aviation Flying and it, it includes the things on your screen there that I'll describe. Uh, we, we do this because flying training is very expensive um, and 
we want to be sure and you want to be sure and I guess your parents want to be sure that you are suited and capable of finishing the degree before you spend too much time and, and money basically um, doing it. So flight selection consists of an academic course which is the recreational pilot license theory that you do in term one of first correction term three of first year. It's the four hours of flying in the DA-40 uh, at the same time, an hour in the simulator and a pilot aptitude test, which is called Compass. Um, on that basis, then we decide if you uh, continue flying in the Bachelor of Aviation flying into your commercial license instrument rating and elective. Here are the electives. Uh, now, if you're an international student, the first two in the list are probably more appropriate for you, although not always. Um, Multi-crew cooperation is a course of training that is wholly in the simulator for 40 hours. And at the end, you get the qualification you need to fly as part of a crew. So the, the 200 hours you do, although most of it's with a flying instructor, you are learning to fly the aeroplane as a single pilot, but that's not what airline flying is. Uh, airline flying is part of a two or three or more crew operation and a separate qualification is needed. Uh, so that's what multi-crew cooperation means. Um, Airline experience is, a, is an elective we offer if a student wants to get more flying hours than they already have done in the course to meet license conversion requirements in their home country. So for example, to convert an Australian CPL, which is what you'll get with us, to a Hong Kong CPL, you need 250 hours. Um, our course is 200 hours, so if you need extra flying time to convert your license, then we can design that elective, that airline experience elective to suit whatever requirement your home country has. Uh, there are other electives there, an instructor rating, which we used to do many, many of, but we don't anymore. Uh, don't do many because most of our pilots go straight into airlines or or other commercial operators, which is somewhat of a shame. But uh, there's also a research project. If money's tight, that one doesn't cost anything. And uh, there's a general aviation elective if you plan to get a job uh, somewhere in regional or remote Australia, then that, that elective is probably for you. This is a curriculum and um, Professor Molesworth did touch on a review that we're conducting. So if uh, you are beginning in 2023, um, you, you probably will do what is in stage one there. However, stages two and three might be slightly different for you. Um, stage one just means first year, stage two is second year and so on. Um, so they are the courses you will do. Um, and I've already discussed the basic aeronautical knowledge or the RPL theory, the commercial and the um, air transport theory. However, in first year, you can see that in terms one and two, there are, there are six courses there for you to do, including aircraft engineering, maths, physics, and transport economics. And then again, in term one of third year, um, there are three management and, and safety related courses. So we are actually very excited about the, the program review. We've nearly completed and, and we hope to have some, some exciting changes to this pretty soon. Uh, if there are any parents listening, um, this is the bit you might be interested in. So flying costs money. Uh, unfortunately, we have to charge for this. The, the Australian government won't pay us or pay you um, to receive flying training. So uh, 
I think there's a slide coming up about when these fees are paid, but in 2023, so that, that's for 2023 commencement students, the, the bulk of the fees will be charged to you in 2024 um, when the flying happens and 143,500, that's Australian dollars. Uh, and that covers the 200 hours of flying, all the briefings, the uniform, um, attempts at CASA exams and flight tests or one attempt at, at each of them um, and sort of various other sundry items. Um, so this is the breakdown of those fees. Uh, this one is starting in 2022, but uh, obviously you'll start in 2023. Other than that, um, the the layout or the timing of the fees is correct. So most of the fees are paid in second year, which would be 2024. Uh, five instalments starting in January every two months. Um, in third year, if you take an elective, then that elective payment would be sometime in um, in September. And you can see that it says zero to 26,000 there, that the flight instructor rating is by far the most expensive one. The research project is zero and um, the other ones are somewhere in between. Okay, now I'm no expert on admissions, but uh, we have people here who are. Um, the, the thing I wanted to highlight for you though, is that there is in addition to a, a UAC International or a UNSW Apply Online process, an internal application form that uh, you must submit to the school. Um, now we do that because there are matters related to your uh, medical certification and the fees and some other arrangements that we need to make directly with you without waiting for applications. Um, to reach us via sometimes a circuitous route. So please do um, remember that internal application form. When we say internal, we mean internal to the school. Um, so we can give you details on how to find that form. Uh, I should also say that down the bottom there, that that's an important statement. Um, the one that says students will also need to obtain a CASA class one medical certificate before beginning flying training. CASA again is the Australian Aviation Regulator and part of being a pilot is, is annual medical checks from a, a, a special doctor who is qualified to do those checks. Uh, we require uh, all students to have a class one medical, which is the one you need to work as a pilot before you begin flying training. What we don't want uh, is a surprise medical problem that's not detected by you or the doctor until much later. Entry requirements. Now these would be similar to the, um, the ones shown before, I believe. Um, and there is a, a more comprehensive list you can get on the website that's that's shown on the screen there. But other than that, um, I would suggest that if you are intending to do a degree in flying and you, and you have the opportunity to fly before you start at UNSW, uh, that you don't. Um, a flight here or there to, to get some air experience is okay, but I, I would strongly recommend that you, you make every effort while you're still at high school to maximise your high school result and give yourself the best chance of, of actually being admitted. Uh, pathways for pilots, I've already discussed licence conversion. If you do intend to work in your home country, you will need to convert your licence um, no, normally. Uh, uh, an Australian CPL, Commercial Licence and Instrument Rating, are ICAO qualifications. ICAO is the, is the worldwide, um, well, they don't supervise, but they, they set recommendations that most countries follow and uh, Australian licences are compliant with, with that. Um, now, airlines, uh, cadetships versus direct entry, um, look, Direct entry means that you apply directly to the airline 
as a pilot who is already trained. Most of our pilots take that route. A cadetship is where you apply to the airline normally before you're a qualified pilot. The airline employs you or, or, or you have some arrangement with the airline and they deliver training to you um, at a flying school somewhere in the world. So I would suggest that most of you who are interested in coming to UNSW would be um, more interested in, in direct entry pathways. And each airline has its own minimum requirements uh, for a direct entry pilot. And they change with supply and demand. So some years, uh, you know, you require thousands of hours and then other years like now, when airlines really are desperate for pilots, then the minimum requirements go down. Um, well, thank you very much. I, th I think that was all I had in the structured part of the presentation. So I'll hand back to Nick and um, hope to hear from you shortly. Excellent, thank you very much for that, Malcolm. And look, I think a lot of detail to digest there. Um, as you can see, it's a very tightly structured uh, program uh, for those students who are looking to go down the flight route. Um, and I can see we've got lots of great questions coming through. So we might um, hold a few of those questions um, until after we've spoken to a few of our current students and we'll bring all of our presenters back onto the screen um, for some Q&A, so stick around. Um, but that gives me a uh, you know, great pleasure right now to introduce two of our current uh, students here at UNSW Aviation, Zoe, who's doing a Bachelor of Aviation Management, um, and June, who is doing his Bachelor of Aviation Flying. Both of them are in their, their third year, so bring a lot of experience um, and can talk a bit about uh, both what it's like inside the classroom and equally what it's like to be uh, outside the classroom. When it comes to things like the club and societies, I know um, I think Zoe in particular is very keen to talk about the aviation uh, society. So on that note, um, Zoe, I might throw over to you first to introduce yourself and, and give us a bit of background about what you've been up to here at UNSW. Sure. Um, thanks, Nick, and thanks, Brett and Malcolm, for um, introducing the course. So, um, hi, everyone. My name is Zoe, and I'm a third year aviation management student. Um, a little bit of background um, about myself. I love aviation, and I'm pretty sure that some of you here are aviation enthusiasts as well. Um, since I was young, I already enjoyed being on an aircraft and the aircraft, um, the airport just gave me um, a really strong sense of belonging. So I had a really clear goal that I wanted to do something related to aviation um, for my career at a very start. And I guess that's um, when my aviation journey kicks off. And um, as I'm saying that I was my, this is my final year of the course, I can tell you that it's a really interesting course that covers um, aviation topics ranging from operating an airline to baggage handling services in the airport. And there's one course called um, the airline management where um, we were divided into groups and we're in charge of our own simulated airline and we can compete with the other group's airlines. And in that simulation, you got to buy your own aircraft, schedule your cruise, decide on um, what the destinations that you would like to fly to. And um, so I think the course itself is very practical and provides a solid base if you like to pursue a um, career in aviation. Um, in regard, regards to the support that UNSW offers academically, um, there was an online writing platform um, that was introduced and uh, more like the society side and also a part of the Aviation Society and I'm the events director of the society. And it's a really good platform to gather students who are interested in aviation and planes together. And we also often have activities such as um, plane sporting, barbecue, and also professional events such as um, LinkedIn workshop. And we had a tour to the NAFTA, um, which is Australia's biggest ground handling company. And, um, to, and we also invited people from Qantas and the Sydney airport to give us a sharing session to our students. So I would say that society is like really um, the place that we, I got to build a connection, not only with um, my course mates, but also with industry professionals and tech start my career. Um, so that's basically it for my bit. I'll pass on to Jun to introduce himself and talk a bit more of his flying journey. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, so hi, guys. Uh, my name is June. I'm a third year Bachelor of Aviation flying student from Singapore. I'm an international student at uh, UNSW. I stayed on campus uh, at 
Columba House actually, which is one of the uh, on-campus accommodations that are available at UNSW. Uh, I'm also a uh, Bachelor of Flying student, as mentioned. I am currently doing my commercial pilot license and awaiting to go on to the Piper Seminal to do my multi-engine and instrument rating. I've completed my air transport pilot license theory as well. So most of my uh, remainder of my university degree is with um, just a flying component. Um, just a little bit background on the course itself. Uh, it is a very small tight knit community. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, interaction with among, among each other for uh, collaborating on the commercial license examinations as well as the air transport pilot license uh, exams. We study together, we hang out together, and we share our experiences and collaborate to make our university experiences a lot better. Uh, during our commercial pilot license uh, flight training, we do fly to a lot of uh, various regions in New South Wales, which is where Sydney is based. Uh, we also had a few uh, events where we do fly away to further away cities, such as to Melbourne or to Brisbane on a flyaway to build our commercial pilot license experience as well as we've had a uh, uh, a visit to the Qantas engineering base where we got to meet with uh, Qantas engineers and look up at the aircrafts closely at mascot in Sydney airport. Uh, so I'd like to hand back to Nick who can continue. Thank you very much for that June and Zoe. Um, great to, to have you here to share some of your experiences and, and yeah I mean I personally I'm very glad to hear you've, you've both had a great time so far and, and obviously you're excited for the fact that you're approaching the end of your, your program of study. So look this brings us to the Q&A component of this evening so thanks again for everyone uh, for hanging around. Um, I can see we've got plenty of questions that have come through so look we may not be able to get to, to all of them today but we will get through as many as we possibly can. So I'm going to invite all of our presenters, um, both Zoe and June, and also Malcolm and Brett, back to the virtual stage to answer some of these questions. Um, and look, Brett, I might actually throw the first question over to you. Um, and this question has come, come through from a, a prospective student who wants to know what type of, of work students often get up to while they're actually studying their course. So I guess the, the student's looking for, you know, do, do, do current students get up to part time work? And, and if so, what does that often look like? Yes, students, it's up to the student whether they want to work throughout their degree. Um, at UNSW, we have three terms. Um, so the opportunity for external work is um, predominantly through specific times of the year. Um, and yes, you can. You can um, you can take any employment uh, that's suited as a casual employee because generally you can't complete the degree um, while working full time. And just let me answer two questions in this, Nick, because there was a question about whether we are online or face to face. At the moment, we're a combination of the two. So we deliver face to face courses as well as some courses are presented online or delivered online. In terms of employment, um, you we have students who are working in the industry as a casual employee and then we have those working outside the industry such as at retail um, as a casual employee while completing their studies so it's entirely flexible from that perspective. Wonderful to hear. Thanks for that, Brett. Um, and, and look, I mean, I, I engage a lot of our current students across UNSW science more broadly because that's what my role encompasses here at UNSW. Um, and I can definitely vouch for that. We have students who, who pick up lots of different uh, opportunities throughout their degree to build their skills, um, but also to, to you know, make ends meet and, and really uh, sustain themselves as they go throughout their degree. Now, look, we've got a few uh, flying related questions. So, Malcolm, I might bring you back up to the virtual stage uh, and throw a bit of a quick fire uh, few questions your way. Um, the first question is from a student who um, is interested to know if it's possible for them to still do uh, an aviation flying degree um, if they suffer from motion sickness. Uh, it is. Um, we. Uh... I don't want to put you off here, but we we had a, a student many years ago who was physically sick on every flight he did up to the commercial flight test, which is 36, about 60 flights. Um, this guy persevered and with, with, with support from his from us and his his doctor and his family, uh, but he was desperate. Um, to be a pilot, and he, he is now. He's working in the US as a captain on a on a on a regional jet. So, um, 
the the thing that m might stop you is if you can't get medical certification because there's an underlying physiological problem that causes the motion sickness but that in my opinion is very unlikely and that 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 that's something you should address with with the doctor um and it's one of the reasons we ask you to get a medical first but uh no the the the, the answer is yes um if if most people we've come across uh, have some form of motion sickness at one time or another during their training, some more than others. Uh, but what we find is that it dissipates um, as you as you sort of experience and your tolerance for being in the air grows, uh, the more flying you do. If, if it is, sorry, well, just one oh, more thing. On. If it is a concern for you, you, you probably should do a few flights in an aeroplane somewhere. Um, to just just to see how you go. Thanks, Nick. All good. I'm going to keep you on the the stage, Malcolm, because we've got a few more questions related to flying. Um, I think very inspirational to hear of that student who persevered um, despite their repeated motion sickness. So I think a really positive answer for the student who's joining us here today. Um, I'd like to, to stay with you, Malcolm, and ask um, for international graduates of our uh, Bachelor of Aviation Flying program, are they able to stay on and work as a pilot in Australia or are they only able to work uh, back in their home country? If you are able to get a visa that allows you to work in Australia, then the qualifications you'll get with us certainly permit that. Second, Airlines in Australia for many years would not employ people who weren't either Australian citizens or permanent residents. That's changed um, and that, that will continue to be the case in my opinion because airlines are generally so desperate for people. So, I mean, for example, if you have a look on the Qantas Link uh, website, they're the, the regional carrier for Qantas their uh, employment requirement uh, in relation to, to, to what we're talking about now is that someone who holds a passport with access to any port flown to by the airline is employable. Hello, Malcolm, I might keep you there. I know we're, we're really picking on you here in this Q&A. One final question and then I'm going to throw over to our current students. Um, this question is about the interview, and I think you kind of touched on this uh, a bit because obviously, you know, there's the internal application form that has to be submitted as part of that additional selection criteria. But what exactly are we looking for in that interview process? And, and I, yeah, I don't know whether you can reveal any, but what are some of the potential questions that students might be asked in that interview? Yep. So the, the interview has a dual purpose. The, the, the first purpose is to make sure that you the student understand the financial component, so the fees, to make sure that uh, you understand the um, medical certification component and also the, um, the time and effort required um, to pass the course. The other purpose is for us to make a bit of an assessment on you and I'll, I'll run through some of the, uh, the things we're looking for, but and and I don't mind giving you some of the questions. They're they're, they're reasonably standard. Um, starting with why do you want to be a pilot? So, what we find sometimes is that that people are attracted to wearing a pilot uniform and strutting around the airport, um, but not much else. When in reality, um, flying an airplane is a hard job, uh, and you you need to be aware that. It involves operating a complex machine in circumstances that aren't always in your favour, both environmentally and, and dealing with other people. And those sort of skills and attributes that you need to operate such a complex machine, uh, not everyone has. So. What we're looking for is firstly mental arithmetic. So um, get good at multiplying things in your head and adding things and subtracting things. Um, we're looking for the ability to plan, to use initiative, to communicate, to 
accept constructive criticism and some measure of independence because as I said before, we're, we're going to send you out for 70 hours of flying in an airplane by yourself. And if you're an international student, that would be around the countryside you've probably never seen before. So the interview is, is conducted before admission. Um, yeah, I, I think you get a conditional offer and then we do the interview, something like that. Um, so yeah, and it's also an opportunity for you to ask me or whoever's conducting the interview. It's it's only one of two or three of us who, who would do these. Uh, any questions you, you have? Excellent, thank you for that, Malcolm. Um, I hope everyone at home was paying attention and was writing down some of those potential questions. Um, keep in mind, we uh, will be sending the link to tonight's uh, video out shortly as well. Um, so you'll be able to go back over and re-listen re to um, some of that really valuable advice there from Malcolm. Now, we are approaching the end of the session, so I'm going to quickly um, run through a couple of the admission style questions that we've received. Um, and uh, there's a few questions here around bridging courses and assume knowledge. Um, they might be from some of the domestic students who are uh, potentially joining us on the call. Uh, but regardless, um, I guess it's really important to know that there's no prerequisite subjects here at UNSW. So we do have assumed knowledge, which effectively is um, the level of background knowledge that our lecturers um, and academics will assume that you have um, when you're in the classroom with them. So. For example, um, if you're doing our uh, aviation flying or aviation management programs, we expect that you've got um, equivalent knowledge to the HSC, which is the qualification studied um, here in New South Wales, equivalent to HSC level advanced mathematics. So um, and that I think very much speaks to what Malcolm was talking about before in terms of some of that uh, you know, mental, uh, you know, mathematical uh, skills that are required um, when it comes to flying, um, but also the fact that, there's, that there is a, a lot of that that underpins these programs. So it's assumed knowledge. It definitely doesn't mean uh, that it's a prerequisite, so it won't ever prevent you from getting um, into the program itself. Um, we won't look at whether you've got that or not, um, but our, our academics and uh, our instructors will expect that you've got that level of background knowledge when you're in the classroom. So if you haven't met that, you could look at doing a bridging course we offer bridging courses um, in physics, chemistry and mathematics. Um, so you can look at doing a bridging course. They run just before the beginning of um, term um, and they're a great way to kind of refresh yourself on some of that knowledge um, and also you know, get, get ahead and fill in some of those gaps um, if you, you haven't necessarily studied to that level um, that is recommended. Um, a similar question is, is physics um, recommended uh, for year 11 and year 12? Um, again, the same, same same advice applies there. So it's not an assumed knowledge. Um, it's never going to hurt. Um, but really, I mean, our best advice is to do the subjects in, in your senior studies that you're most passionate about and you're most going to enjoy um, because they're going to help you um, achieve the maximum results in whatever your secondary qualification is. Um, and again, because there's no prerequisites, we're looking for the, the best applicants. We're looking for you know the best and the brightest here at UNSW. Um, and so, yeah, there's many options such as bridging courses to bridge that knowledge um, if you haven't necessarily studied um, all of those areas before. Another question uh, is relating to our uh, graduate diploma of flying. Now, I guess I, I should really um, you know, clarify to students who might be on the call here that this is only open to domestic students at this point in time as a, a, a program. Um, and there's a question about, is there an interview for it? There is an internal application form specifically for the graduate diploma of flying, um, and there is equally an interview component, um, which is held as part of the additional selection criteria for that program. I think that pretty much brings us to uh, the end of our, our time. And so on that note, I'm actually going to throw back, I'm going to throw all of our, our panelists under the bus here um, and give them one final question. Um, and I might start with Zoe and June um, and we'll work our way down the line. Um, Zoe, if you could give yourself um, a bit of advice or, or in fact, um, you know, any of the high school students, um, prospective students who are on the call here today, um, what would be the advice that you, you would give to them if you had to boil it down to, to one kind of piece of advice for those who are thinking about um, a career in aviation? OK, so um, it's a very good question. Um, if only bring down to one thing, I would say commitment um, that accompanies with um, your perseverance. Know what you want to do. If 
um, aviation is something that you really like want to pursue in your future, like me, go down to that path. I know like um, now like the industry isn't um, at its best stage, but um, we all have like good hopes in it. So if you are real, um, like really determined to do that, I'm really, I'm sure like you will be able to reach that point with your first experience. And that's really, really good advice. And the commitment aspect um, and you know, being really driven, I think we've kind of heard that echoed um, for both yourself and, uh, and June, but also uh, from the, the, you know, the academics here um, on the call as well. Um, June, over to you, what's your piece of advice um, to those who are thinking about a career in aviation? Uh, my piece of advice would be quite similar to Zoe, but I would say be open-minded and be willing to learn new things as, it, as they come to you. And even if circumstances may not work out the way it may be, take it as a learning challenge and learn to overcome that challenge. Brilliant. I, I like that. Um, very short and sweet as well. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I think yeah, it, it is a really good mindset to have. It doesn't matter what degree you're going to do, really. Um, you know, seeing things as a challenge and being able to, to rise above them and know that there's lots of support available. I think we heard some of that support earlier um, and there's definitely um, a lot of support services, both within the School of Aviation, but also across UNSW to make sure that you're achieving your best in your studies. I'm going to throw to Malcolm next. Uh, Malcolm, maybe for those who are thinking more on the flight side of things, and what would be your advice to those thinking about getting into aviation flying? Um, I, I echo the previous comments, but uh, I want to emphasise that that flying is safe first and then fun second. Um, so the the requirement for safety is paramount, but often people get so involved in the details and studying the books, which is all important. I know, but no, no one learns to fly to pass exams. They they learn to fly to get in the aeroplane. So whenever possible, even before you start flying, just remember to step back and think about what you're doing and 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 really, you know, savor each experience as it comes, but get the safety part right first. Definitely. No, I think that's, uh, again, as someone who flies semi-regularly, I think uh, the safety element is definitely important. Um, and Brett, I'm going to throw over to you uh, to wrap us up here uh, with your advice. We might go back to maybe those who are thinking about aviation management. What would be your, your piece of advice to them? Um, echoing what Malcolm has said, you have to enjoy what you're doing. And aviation is a dynamic and it's a very interesting course to, to undertake. So for me, you've got to have a love of aviation. You have to have an interest in aviation. Without that, it will be a struggle. And it's like any degree. It's not unique to aviation. It's like any degree. So you have to be passionate about aviation and follow your dreams. Wonderful. So look, on that, that note, um, I think it's a, it's a lovely note to wrap up on. Um, you've heard the passion here from um, you know, our head of school, our director of uh, flight operations, um, and some of our current students here. And uh, I guess this is really just that first um, opportunity to begin uh, connecting in um, with UNSW and to begin that, that, that journey. So um, look, I, I encourage you to connect in with us, um, make sure that you are um, staying in the loop, we've got a lot of uh, upcoming events. Um, there's a lot of open days, info days, um, and we're, we're looking back to uh, hopefully, not too far down the track, getting back into uh, international road shows and travel. Um, so we look forward to connecting in with you very shortly. Um, if you want to stay in the loop, um, there's a, a short URL on the screen there. Um, and that really means that you're at the, the, the kind of the top of the list when it comes to being notified about some of the upcoming events and activities. Um, one of the ones you should definitely keep an eye out for, though, is the upcoming Current Affairs and Aviation short course. Now, this is being delivered in just a few months time. Um, it's on the 27th to the 28th of September, and it's your chance to get a taste of aviation and explore the diverse opportunities um, across uh, what is, you know, as we've heard before, a very dynamic, very interesting, um, very, very important sector. So it's being delivered online. So for those of you who are um, joining us um, from abroad, um, you can definitely tune in. It's going to be in a hybrid format, so you can join us um, in a, an online version. Um, for any domestic uh, students who are joining us, any domestic high school students who might be um, with us and are here in Australia, um, you can also join us in person. Um, or online, depending on your preference. So um, more information is on the, the link there. And I might, in fact, ask my colleagues in the wings 
just to post that link um, into the, the chat as well so that everyone's got that available. Um, and indeed, we'll be sending you an email out shortly with a link to both this video, um, but also to that short course if you would like to get involved. Um, and as I say, I think uh, it, this is really just the first chance to engage with us um, and hopefully get inspired about a career in aviation and where that can take you. Um, but I encourage you to reach out to our future student advisors at any time um, over the coming year if you've you've got any more questions. Um, and really, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I want to echo um, yeah, the, the kind of the sentiment and the excitement that, that's here in the room. I think there's you know, huge opportunities that we're seeing um, across aviation as the industry rebounds. Um, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Brett, Malcolm, uh, and our current students for for you know both June and Zoe um, for their great insights. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, I equally want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, as I say, we'll be in touch again shortly with the link to this recording and some additional resources. Um, but apart from that, on behalf of UNSW, um, we wish you all the very best for your studies, um, and we look forward to welcoming you to our community very shortly. So take care, um, and we'll see you very soon. Cheers. You, you're the person the world needs. Life is changing and the future is uncertain. You may not know how or why yet, but you know you're here to make a difference. You're not waiting for the universe to give you the answers. You're finding them for yourself. Challenging echoes with evidence. Few people have great ideas. Even fewer make them happen. It takes a dreamer, an explorer, a researcher, a leader, a thinker. It takes someone like 